on YouTube. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is Friday, June 5th. Thank you for joining us for another media briefing. Today, we will hear from Acting Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Shuli Wong. We'll then have an update from Regional Chair Karen Redman, and we will also hear from Region of Waterloo CAO Mike Murray. Uh, we will get started with Dr. Shuli Wong. Go ahead, Shuli. Good morning. Um, so the number of new cases continues to remain relatively low at the moment. As of 10.30 uh, this morning, our dashboard shows we have 110 active cases remaining. Approximately 5.6% of people tested in the region are testing positive for COVID-19. A total of 927 cases or 80% of positive cases in Waterloo region are now considered resolved. There are currently 13 people or 1% of our cases who are hospitalized. The outbreaks in long-term care and retirement homes continue to stabilize and decrease in number. We recently, um, sorry, we, we, have, we currently have five active outbreaks and a total of 33 have now been declared over. We do not currently have any new outbreaks in workplace settings. So overall, we're in a much better place than we were during our peak in April, but we're not out of, we're not out of the woods yet. <clears throat> our goal going forward is to keep the number of new infections low while we continue to gradually lift restrictions and open up our economy. So in closing, the virus is still active in our community. It can take up to 14 days for symptoms to develop from the time we may have been exposed. So it is vitally important that we do not let up on public health measures. Let's continue to practice physical distancing, wearing a mask when we are in close proximity to others, washing our hands often, and even if we develop only mild symptoms to stay home and get a test. So these measures will help protect our families, our friends, our neighbors. I know the past few months have been difficult and the past week has been particularly hard for many in our community. Continuing to follow these public health measures is our new normal. Even as more businesses and organizations begin to reopen, these measures will remain essential. And we must continue to protect one another. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Let's continue. Thank you, Julie. We'll now hear from Karen Redman. Go ahead, Karen. Thanks, Julie. On Wednesday this week, it was heartening to see the solidarity in Waterloo Region. Thousands turned out for a peaceful march in downtown Kitchener to protest anti-Black racism and police brutality. Thousands more watched on Facebook live stream. And I want to thank the organizers for a job well done. I was also very glad to see that most people who participated were protecting each other by wearing masks and other personal protective equipment. There are two more solidarity marches today, and I'm hopeful that these also will be peaceful and safe gatherings for this very important cause. Yesterday, the Ontario government announced the Premier's Council on Equality of Opportunity, a new advisory group that will provide advice on how young people can overcome social and economic barriers and achieve success. The Council will also advise government on long-term actions that can be taken to support youth during COVID-19 outbreak. It's also good to hear that the Ontario government will be supporting Black communities to address the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 by allocating $1.5 million in funding to organizations that support Black families and youth. This funding will be used to provide urgent COVID-19 supports and address the immediate needs of children, youth, and families. As things begin to reopen and staff return to work, I often wonder what new normal will be like. One thing is certain is that we won't emerge from this lockdown suddenly immune to COVID-19. The vast majority of us 
will still remain susceptible. In this in-between time, we must maintain a delicate balance of restarting the economy and keeping the virus at bay. That's why we must work at physically distancing in public health mes measures, like wearing a mask and washing your hands into every aspect of our daily lives until a vaccine is developed and the World Health Organization declares this pandemic over. This in the interim will be our new normal. So in order to provide successfully into the next phase of the pandemic response, I must continue to emphasize that we all need to remain vigilant with our public health measures and physical distancing. Businesses are working hard to prepare their establishments and provide a safe environment for their employees and for the public. At the region of Waterloo, we will continue to provide residents with municipal programs and services that they depend on, but we will have to have a new normal as well. We're adapting our buildings, service delivery, and programming to ensure that the health and safety of citizens and staff is maintained. Stay tuned for more details on this and the new ways that you can interact with the region online. In conclusion, the weather looks wonderful this weekend. Please try to get out and enjoy the fresh air and sunshine with your family. Please stay safe and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Redmond. We'll now hear from Region, Region of Waterloo CA, CAO Mike Murray. Sorry, Mike, I'm having a hard time with that today. That's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll give a really quick, uh, our weekly update on um, compliance, monitoring and enforcement activities. So over the last week, um, in monitoring enforcement activities continue. Uh, so there have been over the past week or so, uh, about 161 uh, site visits that involved education, warnings, uh, interaction with people, reminders about uh, the emergency orders that are still in place. 227 site visits where no action was required uh, because you know either there was no um, uh, no violations of emergency orders and or um, you know things were resolved before uh, the inspectors got there and um, three uh, charges laid uh, over the past week or so. Uh, one of those uh, was a private residence in Kitchener uh, with gathering um, more than five people. Uh, another was a private residence in Waterloo, a gathering of more than five people and uh, a personal care setting, a, a hair salon uh, in Kitchener that uh, was failing to comply with um, the emergency orders about non-essential businesses remaining closed. And so I think um, it's probably important to reinforce um, what these three charges um, highlight, which is um, emergency orders are still in effect. Uh, the emergency order that restricts public gatherings of more than five people is still in effect. It's still being enforced and the emergency orders around closures of non-essential businesses are still in effect and still being enforced. So there is gradual opening up that's happening, um, but people need to keep in mind uh, that is in the context of uh, emergency orders still being in effect uh, and still being enforced. So that's our encouragement to people is be aware of what those emergency orders are and uh, you know do everything people can to continue to comply with them because they'll continue to be um, enforced by all of uh, the enforcement partners. Thank you, Mike, and thanks to all of our presenters. We'll now turn it over to everyone for questions and we will start with Tim from 570. Go ahead, Tim. Thank you. Uh, this message, this uh, question could be for uh, everyone. 80% and there's only 20 more to go for resolved cases. Is this still gonna be a long road ahead? And besides physical distancing and wearing a mask, what are other steps Waterloo Region can do to get into the final stretch and knock COVID-19 out of the park? Uh, maybe maybe I'll start off. So, um, you know, we, we actually don't know how it will evolve. Uh, we haven't had experience with this virus until the experience that we've had recently. 
So um, we do know though that those measures such as physical distancing uh, are key to uh, preventing acquisition of the infection. And uh, so it's possible that, you know, we're gonna continue to have some level of transmission in the community. And that's why it's gonna continue to be important to maintain those measures. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really the best advice that I can give at this time. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll just add a couple of things. Uh, the other thing that I think is important is that um, the reopening um, happens in a thoughtful, gradual way. Um, that we do it in small steps and that we monitor as we go along um, so that we can course correct if things flare up again. And I think that's the province's strategy is incremental reopening, um, really careful monitoring of any implications of reopening and then adjusting as we need to. Uh, so that I think is what uh, we can do locally and the province and, and the country um, can do is, is do this in a thoughtful, measured um, and gradual way. And Aaron? Tim, if I can just add, I totally agree with everything that's been said, but I think the other thing is people have to continue to take responsibility for themselves. So if you are displaying symptoms or you're not feeling well, go get tested, stay home, maybe separate from the people in your house because we know that the community spread will be our next big hurdle as we go forward. And people really need to stay attuned to that and make sure that they're doing those things as well. And uh, has testing in Waterloo Region stayed at the same level or has it increased or has it dipped in numbers? Uh, so um, the assessment centers who are, um, you know, overseeing the testing um, and as can be seen by the numbers that we're reporting from the data they provide us um, have uh, let us know that really testing volumes have, have been very good lately and have increased uh, significantly since testing was, uh, was opened up and, and expanded uh, broadly. In, in the in the population, so um, it's it's good. It's been going in the and it's been going in the right direction. You're on mute, Tim. Did you have any other questions? Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I just have one more question. Uh, with the solidarity march that happened this week and the others that are going on, is the region concerned about the people who attended? Um, that they may increase COVID-19 num cases or numbers? And if so, is there an urgency to get them tested? You know, I'm always, um, I'm always concerned when there are large gatherings. Um, you know, it was a, a very important matter, um, but it was a large gathering. And so, uh, uh, you know, what, what I've recommended is that people self-monitor themselves uh, for 14 days if they participated in person, and if they develop symptoms, uh, to go get tested. Or if they're concerned, they're also eligible to be tested. Anyone that's concerned, even if they don't have symptoms, is eligible to be tested. Thank you, that's good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. We'll move on to Damon. Go ahead, Damon. Okay, so my first question, um, there was this outbreak at Global Egg in Elmira. And I'm wondering, um, for adding the statistics to the graphs, would those be added to the Woolwich statistic or the home resident of, or the home residence area of those workers? It's the latter. It's always um, according to where they, where they reside. Okay, and would you be able to give us any information about the outbreak at Global Egg? now that it's kind of public knowledge? Uh, so if I look at the dashboard, I'm just gonna quickly yep. look because I, I I can't keep up with the numbers either. Uh, so it looks like uh, we're reporting a total now of 21 cases okay. associated with that workplace, yeah. 
and there's uh, there's more testing that will be done. So, okay, that's my questions for today. Thank you. Thank you, Damon. We'll move on to Joanna from the record. Go ahead, Joanna. Oh, actually, my question was answered, so I don't have one for now. Thanks. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to Namish. Namish. Hey, uh, Dr. Long, this question for you. Um, just, just had a question, a follow-up to Tim's question. Um, I know you, you mentioned that um, everyone that was at the rally should self-monitor. Do you, do you recommend that they completely quarantine, like not go out, or is it just the self-monitoring for now? It's just the self-monitoring for now. Okay. Um, and then I have a couple more questions. Um, the second one here is, um, I know it was asked recently, but is, is there any thought to, um, identifying COVID cases by postal code like they, I believe they did in Brampton and Toronto. Is there any, any thoughts to that um, in Waterloo Region? Yeah, no, we're, um, we're definitely looking into that uh, as we speak. Uh, it will be important to understand that, um, you know, data such as that uh, needs to be interpreted uh, properly and, uh, you know, uh, shouldn't be used to stigmatize neighborhoods, for example. And it shouldn't be used uh, for people to think that even if their neighborhood shows lower rates, um, that they're somehow more immune in a particular neighborhood than, than another one. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking into that. I don't have any new things to report at this time, but um, we just have to make sure with all that kind of data that uh, um, you know, we are weighing the uh, public health benefits as well as uh, the, the potential um, um, negative consequences. And uh, if it's important from a public health perspective to have the data, then we also have to make efforts to um, mitigate potential negative impacts. Great. Just, just another question on, on the Wednesday's rally. I know that I've read somewhere, a couple places that the virus transmits less outdoors, um, does that make you less concerned about um, transmission of the virus with that big of a gathering as opposed to if something like that was indoors? Well, what I can say if something like that were indoors, uh, that's even higher risk. So it's true, okay. but in an outside environment, it's lower risk. But I think we could all see with the, the photos mm -hmm. and the videos that you know it wasn't really possible to maintain the physical yeah. distancing. That, you know, the organizers themselves wanted and were encouraging, which which I really appreciated. Um, but, you know, whenever you have crowds like that, you're going to have trouble physical distancing yourself. And so I was also happy to see the amount of masks that were there. Uh, but it's still a higher risk situation, a high risk situation, actually, when there's that many people. And so that's why, you know, I, people should self-monitor themselves. Okay, thank you. Sorry, if I can just add too, I think sure. it was a really important aspect that it was live streamed and that people had the ability to watch online. I certainly did and sort of join in solidarity virtually. So you could still express your support for this very important issue and not be there in person. I think that was a really nice aspect of feeling like you were part of it. Awesome. Thank you, that's all my questions. Okay, thanks. We'll move on to Nicole from CTV. Go ahead, Nicole. Hi, good morning. Uh, this question is for Dr. Wong. Uh, we have a gentleman, uh, he tested positive early on as did many others. Um, and he received the clearance by public health that they are uh, no longer have the symptoms. It was a verbal clearance. He did not get that negative or second test because he didn't belong to that essential group. What advice and guidance do you have for someone like him for seeking um, things like dental care or going out into public. So if they have had COVID-19 and they've tested positive, they've recovered, yeah. do they need that negative slip when they walk around? Because we now have more people. And the thing is, is that he's upset because he feels he was refused by the dentist despite public health saying he was in the clear. They were just hands off said, you know, we have a hygienist who's not comfortable. Okay, so I, I don't know about the specifics of that situation, but I do know that uh, when we consider someone resolved, uh, we consider that they are no longer infectious. So what advice do you have 
for them though, do they, should they walk around? Like will public health be providing, uh, you know, sort of that slip saying they're no longer infectious because it appears as though there are concerns out there when they go and attempt to seek um, healthcare services like dental care. Yeah, no, um, no, we don't provide um, slips uh, uh, like that. Um, you know, I think these are these might be individual practitioner decisions. Uh, but what what I can tell you is that you know public health. Uh, you know, if we've informed someone that uh, they're considered resolved, that means we no longer consider them infectious, and they should just. Um, they should uh, you know, do the activities that um, they would do, uh, considering that they're no longer currently infectious with COVID. Would you recommend for them to get a follow-up test so that it does come back negative? No, because what we do know is that sometimes people that are no longer infectious can still have evidence of the virus when they have a test, but they're no longer infectious. So unless it's recommended for specific circumstances, either by their employer or uh, usually by their employer, for example, for occupational health and safety um, policy reasons, they, they, they could um, need to be retested. Uh, but in general, uh, for people, um, uh, you know, they don't, not, not under those particular uh, policy uh, re requirements, they don't need a, they don't need another test and we actually don't recommend that they get another test. But this, 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 just so you know, it's, you know, it's uh, the, 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 the advice and guidance uh, from, from the province has over time evolved somewhat, but this is the current guidance. This is the current advice. Um, just give me one quick second. I'm pulling up my second um, question. And uh, my second question is, um, can you just uh, explain why there is such a discrepancy between the provincial numbers on their site and what local public health um, are reporting? Um, are, who should viewers believe when they're looking at the Ontario numbers versus what local public health numbers? Are you able to give specific about yeah, so yesterday, um, the Ontario website said that Waterloo Region had 119 cases and 112 deaths. It seems off. Um, so I'm just wondering if, um, you know, if you can provide some clarity on that. Uh, it could depend on when um, the data are updated uh, on the provincial, uh, in the provincial databases. Um, you know, I think the issue you describe is an issue that affects a number of health units across Ontario. It's not specific to Waterloo. There's a little bit of a delay. I would say um, that the local statistics would be the most up-to-date statistics. Yeah, uh, eventually it's gonna catch up in the provincial database. And um, yeah, it's usually just a little bit delayed. Earlier on when it was, you know, we were in the peak of the pandemic, it was more delayed in terms of uh, local versus provincial, but I think the gap has closed quite significantly since then. Okay, so um, with the province now allowing short-term rentals like cottages and more people, I guess, heading up to cottage country, and I guess people wanting to go visit relatives. I know I have asked this before uh, in terms of getting tested before you go and visit people, but now with um, sh those short-term rentals being allowed um, to have residents from that are out of jurisdiction, are you recommending that people get tested before they go to a different jurisdiction for a short-term rental? No, because uh, testing is um, to determine whether you know you've been infected, and uh, um, you know it's not to say you're good now to go somewhere because you're no longer susceptible to being infected. You can have a negative test, and the next day you could be infected and have a positive test. It's a point in time test. That's also why it's not as good in people that don't have any symptoms. Uh, so um, it's not a measure to prevent uh, spread of COVID. It's a measure to detect when someone's been infected. So the, you know, the, the, 
as we lift those restrictions and allow restrictions, I'm sorry, and allow businesses to reopen, the best thing people can do is whatever they do in terms of their activities, they maintain social distancing, they wash their hands, they don't go and be around others when they're sick. And if they start to have symptoms, they get tested. That's the best advice uh, for people that are going to participate in the activities, um, you know, as, as our uh, social restrictions are, are, are lifted. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. We'll move on to Irene from Air News. Go ahead, Irene. Hi. Um, I think my first question is for CAO Murray. I was wondering if you know how many migrant workers generally come into the region to work? Uh, Irene, the short answer is no, I don't know. Okay. Um, I don't know how many migrant workers come into the region. Uh, what I can tell you is from some of the notes I have, um, 15 separate farms or operations bring in migrant workers to the region. So I don't know how many workers, but 15 separate operations do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then I, so I think my connecting question is to Dr. Wong. Um, of these migrant workers, does the public health unit know how many are here right now? I understand they should have been through a 14-day quarantine, and are they being tested? This is in light of what's happened in Norfolk County and has now spread into Brant County. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so they were under federal quarantine for 14 days. Any, any one of them that would have come into Canada would have been under 14-day quarantine. Uh, by federal authorities, and uh, no, uh, um, you know we, we're not. Um, we don't have any reports current or recent of illness among migrant farm workers. Oh, okay, so they won't. They won't be tested. Uh, yeah, we we don't. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's not. Uh, Something that's generally recommended outside of situations where you, you have a case. Um, although, you know, there's been a lot of people tested recently who don't have symptoms, but uh, no, that's not a, um, that's not something that, uh, uh, again, it's a point in time test and it's not that good necessarily in people that don't have symptoms, it just says a point of time that you were tested, you didn't have something. But right after you get your test, you could get infected. So it, 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 it's not to use as a preventative measure or a measure to say, we're all in the clear. We've had another death in Waterloo Region this week. I wondered if you could tell me where it occurred. Yeah, it was another uh, death that was associated with a, um, uh, an outbreak in a long-term care home. And um, uh, yeah, that uh, it, uh, in a home that whose outbreak has already been declared over. But sometimes, you know, people can, can pass away a significant amount of time later. Um, so that's, that's uh, sometimes happens, but that's, that was the reason. Okay, and then, sorry, one more question. On the, um, on the website under characteristics, it lists the 115 deaths, and there's a percentage of 10%. Uh, uh, what does that mean? 10% of positive cases amongst the deceased. What do, what oh, that, mean? uh, that means among the cases that we've diagnosed, 10% yep. of the cases have passed away. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Irene. Uh, we'll move on to Kate from CBC. Go ahead, Kate. Thank you. Uh, my first question is for Mike. Um, now that the province has come out with guidelines for day camps, is there a timeline for the region to make a decision on that? Um, so uh, what I would say, Kate, is the region um, and all the area municipalities, and I know lots of other organizations in the community are working right now on um, can they open day camps under the provincial guidelines? You know, can they, how can they, what will the capacity be? Um, so 
So the, you know, the areas of the region that have operated day camps in the past are libraries and museums. Um, so our library and museum staff are working on that, like as we speak and going through those guidelines and saying, you know, do we think we can comply with these guidelines and operate summer day camps in a safe and healthy way? And I don't think we have an answer for that yet. Um, I know the area municipalities are doing the same thing. Um, and we also know we need to come up with an answer soon because parents need to know, um, are we going to open and operate day camps or not? Uh, so I don't, Kate, I don't have a short answer to your question. I don't have a specific timeline, but once we have that question resolved, then, you know, we'll, we'll make that information public. And I think different organizations are landing in different spots. I saw something, I think just this week that uh, GRCA had decided not uh, to offer summer day camps because they didn't think they could comply with um, the provincial guidelines. So different organizations, I think, will land in different places depending on um, the nature of their camps, their physical spaces, um, all those kinds of considerations. Okay, uh, and Dr. Wong, um, when you looked at the images of the, of the march on Wednesday and you saw people so close together, were you upset at all at the lack of physical distancing? I sort of expected that that might happen because there's been so much interest in, in this march, right? And, you know, as I mentioned, it's a really important matter. It's a really, really serious matter and there's a lot of pain and uh, people may feel the need to, 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 to be there in person and to, to express their, their feelings. Uh, so I, I, I sort of expected that, um, you know, it, I, I still I'm worried as, as I mentioned because it's, it's a large gathering and it, it is what it is. I also did see a lot of people wear masks, and I was, I was happy to see that. Um, you know, I think it's a sign um, people trying to do their best to protect others. And I, 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 I hope that um, you know, if if if, um, if that happens again, that we continue to try to still try to physically distance uh, from each other. That's the primary thing. Masks are not enough by themselves. They help, but they're not enough by themselves. The core thing that we need to do is to physically distance. Um, but, you know, at least there were a lot of masks. And I just want to go back. Um, Tuesday, maybe half an hour after we were done our meeting, we all got the press release from the province that St. Mary's was taking over management of Forest Heights. Were you aware of that at the time of the press conference on Tuesday? I became aware of the press release after it was released. Did you uh, know about St. Mary's taking over Forest Heights before uh, that press uh, briefing? Very shortly before. Uh, very shortly before. Uh, I think you know these kinds of things, as I understand it, can move very quickly, and uh, it's. Uh, uh, for me, this is a welcome development. Um, you know, the health system partners have been um, for several weeks um, working to support Forest Heights. And I think this is just uh, going to provide um, St. Mary's and the partners with just additional support uh, to be able to, um, you know, um, uh, get this outbreak declared over. And also importantly, to allow the home to resume sustainable operations because it's not a sustainable solution for the long term, as I think you would all agree, um, for um, you know, um, health, health system um, personnel from other health agencies to, to support a, a home on a longer term basis. Um, so it's a very welcome development um in my opinion if you um since you knew about it just before the media briefing is there a reason you didn't raise it while we were all together uh, um it's the ministry of long-term care's decision to make so uh it, it is their decision to communicate um and they also designated saint mary's as the hospital that would take the lead um so again i thought it was most appropriate 
um, for the people who made the decision, the people that have to execute the decision to be the ones to speak to it first. And as we sort of look towards the fall and, and a possible second wave in the fall, yeah. what kind of conversations are you having um, with between public health and the health system partners about preventing mm -hmm. these cases from getting into the homes and what what needs to sort of be done, you know, whether that means no visitors through the summer, that sort of thing, what kind of regulations are yeah. talked about? So, so the province, uh, which has the experience of uh, many homes across the province, uh, right, and many different experiences, and there have been other homes uh, like Forest Heights across the province, as well as other homes that have uh, managed very well uh, when they've had outbreaks. Um, any home is susceptible to having an outbreak. It may have nothing to do with the home. It just may be a staff member, for example, who acquired it in the community. Um, but there have been many, many homes that have done a very good job in controlling the outbreak. Uh, as you've seen, there are many, many homes that had outbreaks with small numbers and that were quickly called over. Uh, but there are system issues uh, that I've mentioned in long-term care homes, long-standing issues. Uh, you know, when we've had a home struggle in, in, in the region, we, uh, health, local health system partners have come together and uh, deployed uh, you know, human resources, um, expertise, et cetera, uh, to, these, to these homes uh, to, to help support them in the immediate term. This is not, as I mentioned, a long-term solution. So what I'm hopeful uh, uh, for is that when the province uh, you know, reviews this, I know there's multiple reviews that have been called or that will be done, uh, that they, they take a look at long-term system solutions for these issues uh, so that our long-term care sector and the and the people who work extremely hard in them day in and day out um, that they can be supported on a on a, on a sustainable basis going forward um, it's 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 you know if it's anything it's it's in addition to the residents it's it's most hard for the people that work in these homes Right, who work so hard and have worked extraordinarily hard during this outbreak as well. Um, but there are these system issues that I think need to be addressed in order to strengthen the system going forward. Of course, health system partners are still going to be there, but it's that's for a short-term uh, response. Um, in terms of, I can go on a little bit, so you can just cut me off. I'm a bit, a bit too wordy, um, but in terms of you know if and when we're going to have a second wave. Nobody knows that. I think because in previous pandemics, you know, we have seen that we need to be prepared. And so I think, uh, you know, we need to take the lessons that we've learned from what we've experienced. Uh, we need to continue to build on the areas in our, in our system, which are weak. Uh, we also need to continue to expand the public health capacity uh, to do the type of, um, you know, case and contact management or what often is referred to as contact tracing in the media. Um, we need to be able to do that well. We need to be able to do that more. Um, if we have more cases, so that's gonna be an important uh, thing to continue to build capacity in, as well as of course, testing. Uh, we need to be able to continue to build the infrastructure to be able to have easy access to testing and uh, to be able to turn around testing results quickly. So all those system issues need to continue to be built up, um, you know, uh, even if we have relatively low rates. And another reason to keep the low uh, rates is because should there, you know, be a natural sort of second wave, so to speak, that um, increases cases, we need to have as low rates as possible before we enter that uh, second phase so that there's less impact. So we have to be prepared. We have to keep working on building our infrastructure. And the last question I had was just, um, you know, we're, we're hearing the province say that we're possibly going to be going into phase two in the next week or so. In your opinion, is Waterloo Region ready for phase two? Uh, what I'm seeing so far is uh, encouraging. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're managing to keep our rates relatively low. Uh, so right now, um, you know, I, I, I think what we're seeing is encouraging and I hope to continue to see that. 
And uh, I, I don't have concerns at this point um, with where the province is going. Um, but again, I'm going to reserve the right to potentially change my mind, depending on what we see with, uh, with the results um, going forward. But right now, it's encouraging. And I don't know if Mike or, or Chair Redmond want to dip in on that one, too. No, I, I would just uh, echo what, uh, what Dr. Wong has said. Um, that to me, the, the trends are encouraging. And, um, you know, if you look at, um, you know, when the province set out their kind of phased approach, they had some um, criteria that they would look at uh, mm -hmm. to determine about, you know, moving from one phase to the next phase. And I think if we look locally, um, I think we're meeting those criteria. You know, it was a leveling off of cases, uh, capacity in the healthcare system, capacity within public health to do uh, contact tracing in a, in a timely way. So, so to me, um, all those indicators are going in the right direction, which I find uh, encouraging. Shuli, do you want to jump back in? Oh, no, I, no, I, I, no, I, exactly. Our, and, our, our trends are, are going in the right direction. And Kate, this isn't exactly what you're asking, but I have to tell you that the business community, chambers of commerce, um, uh, as well as internally at Waterloo Region and um, large and small businesses right across um, Waterloo Region are in the preparation stage. So whenever we get to phase two, they, they will be able to move forward. So there's tons of work being done right now, getting people ready for when we get to phase two, that we will come out of it with the kind of protocols and safety measures that customers, clients, and staff need to have to move forward. Great, and actually, I just have one more. I think I might be the last person, so I, I'm hoping I'm allowed to do this. And Julie's smiling, so I'm gonna go ahead. Um, Dr. Wong, you said, um, you know, we need to build up the infrastructure, and that includes um, being able to do more contact tracing. What do you need to do that? Is it more people? Is it more funding? Um, what can the province provide to you to be able to do more of that contact tracing? Well, the province has said to us, do what you need to do. So we are scaling up our human resources uh, to be able to, 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 to do that uh, case and contact management and outbreak uh, support to, uh, to settings that have outbreak. That's a very big uh, role as well. Um, so yeah, I know uh, the province has set, has set some targets um, for uh, the, the amount of time that we have, you know, to, to reach cases and contacts, that's part of it as well. And uh, uh, Region of Waterloo Public Health is meeting those targets. And, uh, but we need to prepare for having to case and contact greater and greater numbers of people. And so we are, um, you know, scaling, scaling up our ability uh, to, to be flexible as well, to be able to, um, you know, respond if we have to, and also, uh, you know, scale down if we don't need that level of response. Okay, now I'm done. Okay. If I, if I could just add, um, Kate, to that, um, you know, just, just further to what Dr. Wong is saying, you know, that ability to scale up, scale down, um, one, of the, one of the strategies that public health is working on is redeployment of staff. <laughs> Um, so it's not it's not just adding new people. It's looking within our existing cohort and saying, are there people that we can redeploy for sh some period of time as needed um, when we need to ramp up, um, you know, contact case and contact management. And so that I think has been a really good piece of work that public health has done, um, looking at you know our existing um, pool of people and resources and expertise and saying. You know, how can we draw on different parts of either the public health department or even other uh, regional departments as needed um, so that we can rapidly respond, scale up, and then have people deployed back to their home positions as we, um, as we scale down. So yeah, that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the strategies that um, we're using in, in public health and in other places. You know, we've redeployed people to Sunnyside, for example, to provide some support there. Um, you know, so that's just a strategy we've used to, you know, make best use of the existing staff capacity expertise that we've got. Yeah, and that's actually one of the advantages to, to public health being part of the region. Um, we're able to, um, you know, have that, um, 
uh, have regional more 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 regional supports if if if, if we need them. We've had a very supportive, very supportive council. Good, Kate. Mm -hmm. So good. Okay, so we will go to uh, final round. I see Nicole's got her hand up. Damon. Okay, there's a couple of you. Nicole, go ahead. Hi. So you talked about you know um, trying to deal with the waves and the talk of the second wave. Um, in speaking with healthcare advocates. I've asked the question, is there a public health unit that's knocked it out of the ballpark in terms of handling the pandemic in the province? Um, two people, two separate people have pointed their fingers at Kingston. Um, zero, they had only one outbreak at a long-term care home and they have zero deaths as a result of COVID-19. So I guess um, I'm just wondering, one of the things that they did early on is what you just mentioned, redeploying staff. So those inspectors that would have normally gone to restaurants, when that all happened, they redeployed them to long-term care homes and said, watch what's happening at long-term care homes. We'll train you, give you um, tools. I'm just wondering if there is, if you guys are looking at best practices in the province to help handle what may happen in the future. Yeah, sorry, I'll just, I'll just add that I, I actually don't think that uh, you can use, you know, um, health units that have, had lower cases to judge the the case numbers in the community is just the performance of a health unit. Um, you know there there are parts of the province that have had uh, low rates of, of cases, and that doesn't mean that we haven't done the things that you know have been reported. We've done those same things. We've re redeployed since day one. It's not redeploying now. We've had our uh, public health resources redeployed uh, and done things that we normally don't do uh, in order to help support long-term care home sector as a whole. We are generally involved in outbreak management, but we have redeployed a great amount of staff to do the type of stuff that you just mentioned, which is you know, uh, going on, uh, on, on site visits, uh, providing education to homes that are not in outbreak, for instance. Um, so it's not a question of us not having done those things. I don't think it's as simple as that to say, oh, a health unit has had uh, an area in, in Ontario has had more outbreaks. Um, therefore, uh, it's, you know, um, indicative of public health unit performance. Um, outbreaks are spread by people. Uh, and of course, public health just like other healthcare partners has an important role to play, but we all have an important role to play. Uh, and uh, for sure though, um, you know, it, uh, we, we would look at um, best practices that have been done and learnings that come from, from, from across the province and Canada and elsewhere in the world. Um, and th these are the types of things that, you know, there are provincial experts that are looking at and that are advising us on. Uh, so they've already been, as the pandemic has evolved, been providing us updated recommendations and guidance on how to do things. And we have been following that and we have been employing that. Okay, did, Mike, did you have something to add or? No, I, I was just gonna reinforce the last part that Shuli says, because I know that um, you know, Dr. Wong and the public health team are in regular <clears throat> contact with their uh, colleagues in other um, municipalities and other public health units. Um, and so I think there's constant sharing of information uh, between and among uh, public health operations um, and, you know, sort of a constant learning around uh, promising practices and, uh, you know, willingness to uh, adapt as we go along and, um, you know, adapt practices from other places if they're proving to be uh, beneficial. So that, that happens on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. Uh, Damon, do you still have a question? Go so ahead. Um, if anyone wants to touch on this, uh, St. Jacob's Market is now open and it is a tourist destination. There's going to be people coming from the GTA or going on dates and whatnot. Hundreds, if not thousands of people. What message are you giving out to people wanting to go out and spend their weekend at the market? Um, so, um, yeah, so St. Jacob's is now preparing to uh, reopen the outdoor market, uh, um, or they have opened actually. 
sorry, they have opened. <laughs> and, and, and a lower level of one of their indoor buildings uh, this Saturday. And, you know, the, the, the markets will be reopening with primarily market uh, produce, grocery type food items only, no arts, crafts, plants no takeout food uh, where food is eaten on site. Um, and so they will have distancing markers, hand sanitizer stations throughout. They will be managing and monitoring patron flow and they will have other safety protocols in place that they have reviewed with public health staff. And uh, public health will have inspectors on site conducting inspections uh, and they'll, you know, and, and they, they do that periodically and, and, and uh, whenever they feel that they should be on site. Um, and so we will continue to work uh, with the markets on em employing these, uh, th these measures uh, to help prevent uh, transmission of the disease where possible. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions if I get a show of hands? Okay, seeing none, we will wrap this up for today. Thank you all for attending and for your questions. Uh, we'll be back here on Tuesday for our next media briefing. Uh, we wish you all a safe weekend. Take care. Thank you.